We're going to continue with the story of the kings of Rome, starting with the reign of king number seven, the last king, Tarquinius Superbus. We just saw him get rid of Servius Tullius. And, well, as Livy says, now began the reign of Tarquinius Superbus, Tarquin the Proud. His conduct merited the name. In spite of the ties of kin, he refused Servius the right of burial, saying, in brutal jest, that Romulus' body had not been buried either. If you remember before, we talked about how Romulus was either carried up into heaven or ripped apart by senators, and no one found his body. He executed the leading senators who he thought had supported Servius. Well aware that his treachery and violence might form a precedent to his own disadvantage, he employed a bodyguard. His anxiety was justified, for he had usurped by force the throne to which he had no title whatever. The people had not elected him, the Senate had not sanctioned his accession. Without hope of his subjects' affection, he could rule only by fear. And to make himself feared as widely as possible, he began the practice of trying capital causes without consultation and by his own sole authority. So a capital cause, by which they mean case, is essentially anything for which you could potentially be executed. And notice the idea that if he's killed the previous king, well, then people are going to feel, eh, I guess it's not entirely out of the question to maybe kill him if they want to be king next. Returning to the reading, he was thus enabled to punish with death, exile, or confiscation of property not only such men as he happened to suspect or dislike, but also innocent people from whose conviction he had nothing to gain but their money. Those of senatorial rank were the worst sufferers from this procedure. Their numbers were reduced, and no new appointments made, in the hope, no doubt, that sheer numerical weakness might bring the order into contempt and the surviving members be readier to acquiesce in political impotence. Tarquin was the first king to break the established tradition of consulting the Senate on all matters of public business and to govern by the mere authority of himself and his household. In questions of war and peace, he was his own sole master. He made and unmade treaties and alliances with whom he pleased, without any reference whatever, either to the commons or to the senate. He made particular efforts to win the friendship of the Latins in the hope that any power or influence he could obtain abroad might give him greater security at home. With this in view, he went beyond mere official friendly relations with the Latin nobility and married his daughter to Octavius Mamilius of Tusculum by far the most distinguished bearer of the Latin name, and descended, we are told, from Ulysses and the goddess Circe. By this marriage, he attached to his interest Mamilius's numerous relatives and friends. So remember that Rome is merely one of the ethnic Latin towns in the area we call Latium. So Rome is just one little town, and they're all ethnically Latins. His influence with the leaders of Latin society was soon very great, and this gave him confidence for his next move. Declaring that he had certain matters of common interest to discuss, he summoned them to a conference at the Grove of Ferentina. On the appointed day, a great number of them assembled at dawn. Tarquin was late. He did, indeed, put in an appearance on the right day, but not much before sunset. All day, while the Latins were waiting for him, various subjects were discussed, and a certain Turnus Herdonius of Aricia had a deal to say in disparagement of the absent Tarquin. No wonder, his arguments ran, that Rome called Tarquin the Proud. The name was already current, though as yet none dared more than to whisper it. It could hardly be better justified than by his present behavior, which is a deliberate insult to our country. We, the heads of the chief families of Latium, have been made to travel many miles to attend this meeting, and he who convened us does not even take the trouble to be present. Why, it's as plain as a pikestaff. He wants to see how much we will put up with, and then, if he finds us submissive enough, he will stamp on us. A blind man could see how he covets the sovereignty of Latium, if his own people were right to entrust him with power, if indeed it was entrusted, and not stolen rather by a murderous thief, then we, you may say, should do no less. Even so, I would remind you that he is a foreigner. But what are the facts? His own people are sick of him, they are weary of the continual slitting of throats, exiles, confiscations that are going on in Rome, and, if it, that is true of Rome, could we in Latium expect anything better? Take my advice and go home, all of you. Do not trouble to keep your appointment here any more than he has. Turnus, who had acquired some influence in Latium as an inveterate troublemaker, was in the full flow of his eloquence when... 
Tarquin's unexpected arrival cut him short. The audience turned their backs on the orator to pay their respects to the king. There was silence, and Tarquin, advised to give some reason for being so late, said that he had been asked to settle a dispute between a father and son, and that, hoping to reconcile them, he had been unavoidably delayed. And as that little business, he added, has left us no more time today, I will wait till tomorrow to deal with the matters I propose to discuss. The excuse was not good enough for the angry Turnus. No dispute, he said, is said to have replied, is more quickly settled than one between a father and son. All one needs say is, obey your father or suffer the consequences. And honestly, Romans would have agreed with that. Remember, they are an extremely patriarchal society. With this parting shot, Turnus took himself off. Tarquin was the more disturbed by this incident than he let himself appear, and promptly considered ways and means of getting rid of Turnus. It would be politic, he felt, to make the Latins as much afraid of him as the Romans were. He was not yet, not as yet, in a position to openly order his execution, so he decided to attain his object by having him convicted of a trumped-up charge. For this purpose, he managed to persuade certain political enemies of Turtus to bribe one of his slaves to allow a large number of weapons to be smuggled into his lodging. It was done within the course of the night, and very early on the following morning, Tarquin set for certain distinguished members of the Latin nobility and pretended to have received alarming news, adding that his late arrival on the previous day had turned out to be a piece of extraordinary good luck and had saved them all. Turnus, he went on, is, I am told, planning to assassinate me and the leading men in all the towns of Latium. His aim is the monarchy. He would have acted yesterday at the conference had it not been for the absence of his chief victim, myself. He was obliged to wait, and his consequent disappointment was the reason for the bitter language he used against me. I am convinced, if the information I have is true, that when we assemble at dawn tomorrow, he will be there to attack us. He will be well-armed and strongly supported, for a great many weapons I have, have, I have learned, been conveyed to his inn. The truth or falsehood of this can be proved in a moment. Come with me to his rooms, and we can see for ourselves. Several things contributed to make the story plausible. The reckless plot was typical of Turnus, and then there was his speech at the conference, and lastly Tarquin's late arrival, which seemed a reasonable explanation of the postponement of the massacre. Consequently, they were all predisposed to believe it, though they still needed the evidence of the weapons before accepting the other charges. When they reached the inn, Turnus was still asleep. He was awakened and surrounded by guards. Some loyal slaves who offered resistance were seized. Weapons were found hidden in every corner of the building. Further proof was not needed, and Turnus was arrested. Amid great excitement, the Latins were immediately called upon to meet. The weapons found in the inn were produced as evidence, and so strong was the feeling against Turnus that he was convicted out of hand, without even the chance of defending himself. He was bound underneath a hurdle, a very large thing, and weighted with stones was flung into the water, a form of punishment which was a new invention of Tarquin's. So essentially he's crushed to death while drowning. After the execution, of, after the, execution the Latins were again summoned to Tarquin's presence. Gentlemen, he said, I congratulate you. Turnus was a traitor. He was caught in the act, and you have given him his just reward. Now, I would remind you that an ancient treaty between Rome and Latium is still in existence, and that I could act upon it if I so wished. By that treaty, the whole Alban community, together with the settlements founded by the Alban people, were brought by Tullus under the domination of Rome. If you remember, when we were talking about Tullus Hostilius, he demolished the city of Alba Longa. Remember how Medius Fufetius was executed and all that? Returning to this, you, Latins, are of Alban descent and therefore bound by the terms of that treaty. However, it is my belief that everybody's interest would be better served if the old treaty were brought up to date in such a way as to allow the peoples of Latium to share the prosperity of Rome instead of being forced to, to dread a repetition of the miseries the destruction of towns, the devastation of the countryside, which they suffered during the reigns of Ancus and my father. The Latins were quick to see the force of this, in spite of the fact that the treaty was more favorable to the Roman interest than to their own. Moreover, it was obvious that the most influential among them took Tarquin's view of the matter. 
Not to mention that the recent fate of Turnus was evidence of what would happen to anyone who ventured to oppose him. The treaty was accordingly revised, and a proclamation was issued to the effect that the Latins of military age should present themselves fully armed on the day fixed for the purpose at the Grove of Ferentina. In accordance with the edict, men from all the Latin communities duly assembled. Tarquin then proceeded to take certain precautions, seeing that it was inadvisable to allow them independent command with their own generals, officers, and all their own standards, he organized the army units so that each company should consist of Roman and Latin troops in equal numbers, under the command of a Roman centurion. So notice he has now got all of the Latin communities basically to provide troops for him. All the cities that are nominally independent now have to obey Romans, and they have to march under Roman officers. By essentially killing one person and terrorizing the rest. He has conquered a number of towns without actually having to even fight. 